Thank you, Cathy, very much. And thank you also to Affinity for inviting me to um, facilitate what is going to be, I'm sure, an extremely interesting session and, in, and also very topical. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Anwar Alam. Um, Professor Alam is a senior fellow with a Policy Perspectives Foundation in New Delhi. His previous roles including, include professor in the Department of International Studies, International Relations, Faculty of Economics and Administrative Science in the Zirve University, Gaziantep, is I pronounce that right? Gaziantep, Turkey. Professor and director of the Center for West Asian Studies at Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi. Assistant and associate professor at the Center for West Asian Studies at the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and lecturer, Department of Political Science, Aligarh Muslim University in Aligarh. He has been awarded a number of prestigious long and short term fellowships, including the International Visitor Program for Islamic Scholarship, United States in 2002, the Indo French Social Scientist Exchange Program Fellowship in 2003 and 2010, the Alexander von Humboldt Postdoctoral Fellowship in Germany 2004 to 2006, and the AVH Renewed Research Stay Fellowship in Germany in June 2016. He was visiting professor at Fatih University, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, from September 2010 to August 2011. And so it's a very impressive um, CV there, Professor Alam. And with that, I will um, ask you to start your, your presentation. Thank you. OK, I thought you will have some couple of questions to start, actually. Oh, I will? <laughs> yes, I certainly have a couple of questions to start. All right. Um, okay, so um, Professor Alam, I read your uh, paper yesterday, and yeah. as we spoke over lunch, I said that I found it a very optimistic view wow. of India in the current climate. What makes you so optimistic, given the events that we read about in mainstream news about the oppression of minorities and the, the general culture of impunity and violence that seems to be extant in India at the moment? Oh, <clears throat> well, there is a growing violence actually in India, for example, with all kinds of the marginalized people, in fact, that includes women, that includes uh, uh, Muslim communities, that includes other religious minority communities, in fact, uh, that includes uh, Dalit also, in fact. So there is, but uh, probably is that that if, if one looks at the trajectory over the last 20 years of the Indian politics or the mode of governance, then what do we find? We do find is that, that the Hindu-Muslim conflict is epidemic. So this is not for the first time that the BJP is trying to create a fear among the minority communities. I mean, we have the worst kinds of institutionalized rights, in fact, certainly including 2002 in Gujarat, what has happened, in fact, I mean, a crime against the women and the girl has certainly increased tremendously, whether it has to do with the liberalization of the kind of the economy or, for example, the government negligence. But these are all the, for example, the, the violence that we see is also partly because these identities are asserting themselves. These are the peripheral identities, whether the identities of the women, identities of Dalits, identity of the OBCs, identities of the tribals. These are the identities that they are also very powerfully asserting and would like to come into the mainstreams, you know, and would like to define India, you know, because after all, uh, uh, the good part uh, with India is that, and where the, the entire identity politics is located actually is that, that as far as I am concerned, I believe India as an imaginative space. As a nation state, uh, uh, it does not have any fundamental close values. So you cannot really define India. If there are two central things that actually define India, it is basically two words, and that is basically pluralism and the diversity. But beyond this, if you see, for example, that what are the constitutionally defining features of India, I mean, then probably you have none. I mean, like, for example, preamble you will take, for example, but those are the non-justiciable rights. You know, I, I do not come across 
any Supreme Court decisions, unlike, for example, the Turkish experience, or for example, the French experiences, or any kind of, for example, like, for example, what happened in Pakistan, that certain individuals have been arrested or certain political parties have been banned in the name of the violation of the secular regime. I mean, I have not come across. I have not come across any incident in India where the government of India has taken a position that I will not negotiate with you. You know, I have never come across, you know. So the government of India, or for example, those political establishment, has always been open for any kind of negotiation, any kind of the accommodation. And that's how India has basically developed a very plural kind of the governance, in fact. You know, you may have, for example, a different kind of the constitutional modern visions. And certainly, if you look at, for example, the constitutional structures, or if you look at, for example, the political elites that has been ruling, they have the vision, and the vision is that India should become like a Europe. And unless and until you become like a Europe, you can never be a nation, in fact. I am just coming from the Brisbane and the IPSA Congress, and somebody, this question is always because I was uh, presenting my paper on the Gokha land, in fact, the negotiating statehood, actually. And somebody said that, well, Professor Alam, that I mean, why are you using the term nation state? You are basically a state nation. You know, but how long I should wait to become a nation state? My problem is this. If the Europe has, or the West has, its own experience of a nation state in terms of singularizations and the homogenizations, and if faced with the immigration, they are now experimenting with the pluralism, and having a difficulty to deal how the, to dealt with the plural cultures. As an Indian, I am born with a multiple identities, and I experience national reality only in a plural terms. What can I do then? And therefore, I really do not understand the discourse that this could be problematic for the Europe, but for us, it is perfectly normal. So one can have a very singular vision of a nation, one can also have a very plural vision of a nation. But what goes into the modern literatures and what goes into the narrative actually, ah, how can the democracy survive in India in such kind of the diversity? You have a three thousand language, you have the caste, you have religion, you have this, but it, the democracy becomes functional, in fact. And that basically emerges as a paradigm and paradox. And this paradox emerged precisely because you are accustomed to understand politics in a very you know, old euro center west normal, in which there will be the hegemony of secularism in a public sphere or you have constructed a kind of very institutionalized in which all ascriptive identities has to be totally privatized, has to be totally marginalized, it's as simple as that. And the only identity that, 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 that is permissible in the public sphere is the identity of the citizenships, which has been understood in terms of the secular language, in fact. But what will happen? There would be a secular hegemony, but what will happen to those minorities? What will happen to those gender? What will happen to those women? I mean, how does they are going to reflect their identities? And certainly, therefore, speaking from this point of view, that as an Indian, I am, I am, I am very much fortunate. And I believe that I am very much fortunate to born in this nation, because that nation and that polity has given me right to live with my identities, both in private sphere and the public sphere. The Indian government and Indian polity and the Indian state systems has never evolved any kind of the very sharp distinctions between the private and public, formal and the informal. You know? So therefore, uh, I, the, the Indian state and the government has never tried to impose anything upon me. It never imposed languages. It never indulged any kind of the bodily reform. You know? And therefore, I am perfectly at home. I am perfectly at ease to live the way I want to live. They did not change my food habit in the name of civilizations, actually. They did not ask me that in order to be a nation that everybody should speak Hindi, in fact. In fact, one of my friends, just to share a joke, in fact, who did a PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University, he was a student of the Hindi, actually. He did a PhD in Hindi, in fact. And when he finally submitted a PhD in Hindi, he said, what the hell is this? He said, what happened? Well, I know every day I speak Hindustani or Urdu. Why did I do PhD on Hindi, actually? Uh, so. So you pick up any words, you juta, moja, bartan, jhadu, bistar, plate, there have been any words. And, and if the Bollywood have not survived, and the Bollywood survived and the Bollywood could really function only with the mixtures of the Urdu and the Hindi actually. 
But if you speak proper Hindi, nobody will understand. I mean, that's the hard reality. And therefore, with this, I simply would like to mention is that, okay, yes, the Muslim community is certainly marginalized. There is no doubt. Today, what has happened is that, that the visibility has slightly increased because we have a different kind of the government who is predominantly being looked upon into the left in the liberal literature as a kind of the fascist forces. That's it. But I do not subscribe to this that the BJP is a fascist. I have debunked this thesis, actually. I don't believe into this. It cannot be. Because the BJP could be, BJP wants a very centralized state. Certainly it has a vision, in fact. It has a homogenizing. But it is inherently unable to homogenize what constitutes a Hindu. Because the BJP fundamentally believe in the caste system. And the caste is internally diversity. You know, so what would you do then? Then the only thing you can do is that you can have a rhetoric of anti-Muslim politics for the sake of organizing your own politics. The compulsion of Modi government is that even if the Modi government do some good work for the Muslims, the Muslims are not going to vote for him. That's the hard reality of the day. And it's an electoral democracy. Since it is the electoral democracy, they have to look forward their own constituency. And to nurture that constituency, that requires an uh, element of aggressive Hindutva to a certain extent, in fact. So what I believe is that the Muslims is certainly economically and socially and educationally deprived, no doubt. But I do not subscribe that the Muslim community in India is culturally deprived. Its symbolism is powerfully institutionalized in a public sphere. It is not culturally deprived. Since it is not culturally deprived, it is in a position to negotiate, to communicate, to assert. I mean, this is the community that actually forced the Raju Gaudi government to pass a very retrogressive the women's law. The Shabano case. Sahabano case. Yeah? It's remarkable that look at this assertion, in fact. It's forcing the government to pass and annul the decisions of the Supreme Court. You know, so it is not uh, culturally marginalized. So I would like to place my identity question within this larger discourse that I do believe is that the identity politics in India of, and when I am mean, speaking of identity politics, I am not saying only in terms of the religious identity. I am not saying in terms of only the caste identity. I mean, these are also very homogenizing category, in fact. Today we see within India, there's a remarkable assertion of Dalit Muslims. You know, there's a remarkable assertions of OBCs Muslims, in fact. There's a remarkable assertions of a very different kinds, you know. So similarly within Dalits, and Dalits cannot be the homogenizing category, and new leaderships are coming against the Mayabati, but they're all coming in the name of identity, in fact. So what then I believe is that this identity politics to a large extent in India has not become obstacle for the development of democracy, but rather it has enriched the democracy. You know, it has rather enriched. If this would have been not there, then probably Mayavati would have not become a chief minister. If this would have not been there, Kher Narayan and other Dalit would have not become the president of India, in fact. This has basically empowered because they realize that they are numerically strong, in fact. Yeah. Thank you. So and this leads me on to another um, point in your paper that I think um, would be interesting to this audience because as you say, and you know, the Indian Constitution was, I suppose, a kind of, oh, sorry, the Indian Constitution was kind of like a kind of visionary experiment, really, when you think about it with, um, you know, Dalits like Ambedkar and Nehru and so on. But the distinction th um, that often people don't understand about Indian secularism, which you talk about in your paper, is that secularism is very different from the way it's defined in the European context. So it is not a secularism which is about uh, uh, the, the state being completely non-religious or anti-religious, but it's actually a secularism that chooses to behave equally and accommodate all religions equally. So that might be an interesting point for you to perhaps Talk about yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the kind of the secularism that we have in India, in fact, it has basically strengthened the religious identity. It has strengthened the caste identity. It has not worked otherwise because it has never been envisioned. Like, for example, as a Muslim, probably, or coming from, from that community, can tell you that how we understand. There is a one constitutional vision of secularism, but there is the people's imagination of secularism.
So there are basically the two processes, in fact. There is a state understanding of secularism. And in this state of understanding of secularism, the only one thing is pretty clear, that the religion cannot be used for the purpose of uh, humiliating others or purpose of political mobilization, but normally it takes place. So there is. And, but beyond this, that the people's imagination of secularism is that, that this secularism, speaking from the Muslim point of view, means two things. One is that it must fundamentally ensure my physical security. And I'm saying physical security. That's number one. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Muslim politics over the last 60 and 70 years in India, it has centered only on two elements, security and the identity-making demands. You know, whether it's an uh, issue of, for example, a uh, minority character of Aligarh Muslim University, or a question of Urdu, or a question of the Babri Masjid, or a question of any other, it has basically centered on these issues, and the government of India has always addressed positively to these demands, in fact. I mean, so that's there. So as a result, what has happened is that that secularism basically, and whenever there's a Hindu-Muslim communal rights, we normally take a position that the government has basically deviated from the secular principles. That's our understanding, in fact. So in our imagination, we want the government not only to protect our religious identity both in the private and the public sphere, but also to promote our religious identity in a public sphere. That is our expectation. And if the government is not being seen, then the government being accused of deviating from the secular norms of the governance, in fact. Now, the problem currently that the Muslim, go Muslim community is having with the BJP government is the problem is not of the marginalizations, actually. It's not problem of the economic and the political that historically has been. And that's a different debate. I do not want to enter into that, that the Muslim community have been marginalized because of the hostility of the state or because of, for example, the discrimination of the majority community or also because its own internal perception of Islamic way of living, actually. So I do not want to enter into that debate it's why it has been uh, marginalized in many of the indicators, in fact. But where it has developed uncomfort with the BJP government, because there is an expectation that when you come into the power, you are normally belong to each and every section, in fact. So you will not work only for that community. What the BJP consistently at the center and the state level is doing is that, that for the first time into the history of the Indian politics, that there is a very conscious decision on the part of the prime ministers and the chief minister for Yoga Dhanath and wherever they have to dissociate from a Muslim symbolism in a public sphere. That's where it matters. Modi has consistently refused to wear the Muslim cap in public places. You know, when, when he was offered, he refused. You know, and similarly, for example, Modi will nowadays will not greet the community or a nation on the occasion of Eid. There is an official statement which is normally released through press at such occasions, in fact. He would not do that. Neither the Modi government will basically throw any kind of the iftar party in the month of Ramadan. Means I have remembered that I have attended the iftar party of Bajpai and I have attended the iftar party of Lal Krishna Advani. You know, but this government is a different government in this sense. And this has actually given a perception to the large Muslim community that the Muslim community has become unwanted. It has become unwanted not because of its lack of representation into the political and the economic and the opportunity structures, but the, for the first time it clearly see that the government does not want to identify with your symbolism in public sphere. That is something very clear. You know, and that's where the comfort is. But the BJP government actually does it because it would like to give a perception that we are against any kind of the Muslim appeasement. You know, so, so we are strongly uh, implementing, you know, that we are against very much Muslim appeasement, in fact. That's where our discomfort actually come, in fact, you know. Otherwise, uh, I have recently, for last three months, I have been conducting a survey, particularly into the UP and went to the Banaras and the Jhansi and many other places. In fact, the business as usual goes. I mean, yes, the meat sector has been badly affected. There is a no doubt, in fact, and it affected the entire chain and supply, but it has come back again, in fact. You know, initially there was a problem, but it has come back again, in fact, you know. And, and so, so that is the problem, and as far as the fear is concerned, another concern is concerned, but the minorities have also inbuilt their own fear, in fact. Yes, the degree has increased this time. There's no doubt about that. Certainly the degree has increased, because if you realize 
that the UP is the hotbed, the 2019 elections are coming, there could be. So there is a, that perception of the fear that is certainly is there. But otherwise, the business is as usual, in fact. And they have a serious complaint with the Modi government or with the, not on the account, but on the account that these prime ministers or their politicians are not sharing any kind of the Muslim symbolism, which was a norm in the Indian pattern of governance, in fact. That's where they have a serious complaint, in fact. They don't have a complaint on the economic issues, in fact. Uh, we've, uh, we've got yeah. a f about five minutes before I think I open it up to questions. Please. Oh, sorry. I said we've got five minutes before we open it up to questions. But one of the things, again, I found very interesting in your paper um, was, uh, and I think, again, this is, um, this is kind of probably unique to India. I might be wrong. You're the political scientist. I'm not. Um, is that the way you talk about the role of the Supreme Court as, as a way of kind of, 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 um, uh, of consolidating or, uh, you know, supporting versions of secularism, which, as you say yourself, are not really uh, identified very clearly in the Constitution. And, and from what you say in your paper, and which is a very interesting point, it's that the Constitution is deliberately vague so that you know, there are ways of, in, yeah, ways of interpreting it that, that you can use to uh, consolidate a, a state nation or nation state, which is very loosely, you know, formulated. Can you talk a bit more about the, the legal ramifications of Supreme Court decisions? Because I think, again, that's something which is... Which On which decisions was that? No, generally, you talk about Supreme I mean, Court let's see decisions. For or, or Supreme Court, basically, for example, you say... When Modi, um, when the BJP no, tried to... Let us to see some of the examples. I got your yeah, point, for example. Yeah. When the Modi government came, they are basically in love with the Hindi language, actually. You know, so they would like to, for example, they have this Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. You know, we normally use the term Hindustan, S-T-A-N. But when the BJP and the RSS use, they use T-H-A, Than, Hindu Than. You know, there's a semantic and the subtle difference between the two, in fact, you know. So they have this vision of, for example, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, that's pretty, I mean, fair. They are entitled to have their any visions. Uh, but let us see, for example, whenever the BJP government has come in power, they have really miserably failed in, in imposing any kind of their visions. You know, I, I, I gave you an example. And the BJP government came in the 96, in fact, the Bajpai almost five years course is run. It could not pass the bill on the killing of cow. Till date, the Modi government has not, not passed, the central government has not passed the bill on banning of the killing of the cow. Various state government has passed, but the various state government has not passed since the Modi government has passed. They passed since the Congress government has been in power. The Congress government has been the leading government in passing uh, the ban on the killing of the cow. And many of these, particularly in Madhya Pradesh, particularly in Rajasthan, here it was the Congress government that has the power historically, and the BJP is only continuing that tradition, in fact. More recently, for example, uh, I remember that, for example, the government of India wanted to bring the Hindi text or Hindi text through the university grant commission, through the UGC, in fact, and there was such a large-scale uproar by Tamil Nadu and the Andhra and all these linguistic states, the government of India has to drop it, you know. Certainly, it has a vision. But at the same time, I mean, if you look at, for example, the Indian social diversity, there's a tremendous pressure from below, actually. So what would you do then? You know, that, that and, and there is a constitutional structures, and there you have the social diversities. And that's why exactly I'm telling you that, for example, that it cannot be the fascist government because India is not culturally homogenized. That happened with the fascism, and, and India, I mean, Germany at one point of time, have a, a collective hurt, hurt. India cannot afford to develop a collective hurt because it is the kind of the big power in the South Asia, which was not the case with the Germany, in fact. You know, and you are not culturally homogenized. So whatever the message the Prime Minister Modi will give, by the time it reaches Tamil Nadu, many interpretations of that message get diluted, in fact. In Punjabi or Telugu and Tamil and this and that, how many would you do that? You know, when the Prime Minister Modi went, for example, uh, to, to, to campaign electorally in the state of Karnataka, he has a serious problem because of the Kannad language. And he bitterly claimed the interpreter was very bad because he has to rely 
all the time on that interpreter, in fact. You know, and sometimes even the prime minister, in order to appease the Kannad uh, constituency, he'll speak Kannad language, but everybody was laughing because he's unable to speak the Kannad language. So there is a very powerful cultural constraint for any kind of the fascistic, jingoistic, nationalistic kind of that percolated. And therefore, what happened with the BJP? The BJP politics basically get precisely because of this structural constraint, I'm saying, which is powerful embedded. It basically get reduced to two levels. One is get, it get reduced to a level of anti-Pakistan rhetoric that it pitch very high. And the second is the Muslim appeasement. Because both are internally connected with each other. The Pakistan and the Muslims are connected with each other. And therefore, the Modi government decided to hope the Hindu consolidation. Beyond this, it is unable to do any other things. The other things which you find very interesting is that it may have this rhetoric. And it may create a problem for the liberal sections and a secular intelligentsia of the country or the abroad who has a particular idea about the nation's in fact, a very romantic idea about India. And they normally got very disturbed, in fact. But apart from two, if you look at, for example, the BJP, whenever the BJP government has been in power, more state has been created on the linguistic basis. So it is not that way so centralizing to it, actually. You know, it prefers the smaller states for its own reason or for whatever reasons, in fact. So what appears a very homogenizing, centralizing, and the other things, and if I have some access to the state, I mean, the BJP and the RSS have now come to the conclusions that the only way we can govern this country is the only the plural way, so we have to respect this. There's no other way we can govern these countries, in fact. You know? And it is only in this context, I am saying, the Supreme Court has evolved its own basic structures, in fact. And the Supreme Court, I mean, Part of the problem that we have, see, the liberal dilemma at the moment, what we see is that we have a chief justice. Sometimes it appears that it is in the collusions with the government, you know, and likely to give a verdict or Ramjanam Bhumi in favor of the government. But on many occasions, it has uh, declared none and void of many of the Modi governments, in fact. So then the uh, liberal hopes increase. You know, so that's the time. I mean, your hopes increase when it took contrary, but your hopes decline when you seem that it is working with the government. But let's have a faith in a judiciary, in fact. I mean, I mean that's really, it's a totally the institutions, in fact. You know, and judiciary will not work in the vacuum also. If today, for the first time in India, uh, it is not a majoritarian rule, but majoritarianism has come to stay. You know, judiciary will respond to that. Judiciary will respond to that. Large political process will respond to that. And that is why I'm saying is that the Supreme Court has its own through the basic structures or, for example, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, for example, have limited the role of Hindutva without declaring Hindutva as, as, as or, or without declaring Hindutva as problematic. In fact, the Supreme Court has given a positive a uh, decision on Hindutva, saying Hindutva is a way of life. It has legitimized that discourse, in fact, you know. But in many of the other things, I mean, if you look at the, look at the many of the judgment, in fact, I mean, it has held, uh, there are three, four judgments where it has held the Muslims' management of a temple. I mean, and one of the trustee of even a uh, very famous temple of the Puri, Lord, Lord Jagannath, one of the trustees is a Muslim. And people went to challenge in the Supreme Court that how can the Muslims be trustee of a temple? You know, and that family has been trustee historically. You know, the Supreme Court judge a judgment. What is the problem in that? He is actually praying, but that does not make any difference as far as the management and the trust. That is perfectly fine as per the law and the rules and regulation of the Indian constitutions, in fact. You know? So the Supreme Court has been, I mean, I mean, it's certainly one of the important, uh, uh, I would say that, in defining, or for example, it is again the Supreme Court. Today the minority community has not got so much of power only by virtue of the minority provision in the Indian constitution. Both the linguistic minority and the religious minorities, they have got a power by virtue of the many of the famous Supreme Court decisions Telling that the minority communities are entitled to run their own educational institution and states are legally and duty bound to provide a fund to them. You know. 
you know, that's, I mean, you must be knowing this, you know. So that's how the minority communities has become in power, in fact. And one of the consequences of that is that, that there, there are many sect within the Hindu communities. They also went to the Supreme Court and claim that we are also minority now. <laughs> we want to run and, and we want to demand a money because uh, there is a no definition of Hinduism. We are only a sect. We are a minority. We run the educational institutions, which the Supreme Court says, no, you can't. So the, the, that is the implication, and that's how it has become in power, in fact. You know, the Christian community has been largely benefited. You know, Muslim community not. Muslim community could not be benefited by the constitutional uh, opportunity, not because that constitutional opportunity was denied to the Muslim community, but the Muslim community invested their capital in building of the madarsas. The number of the madarsas in India has increased quadruple. It did not invest in a secular education, despite there was an opportunity. Neither it sent their children to the government schools. But that's a, something internal to the Muslim community preferences. You know, so that's a different debate. But the Christian community in India has been enormously benefited. And if there are two sectors where they have marked their, where they marked their presence is education and a health. You know? And we all, whether it's a Muslim, Hindu, Christian, communist, liberal, everybody would rush to the Christian missionary, yeah, a Christian missionary schools because they are being looked upon as a quality education, you know. So, so they have been benefited from that, you know. So, so I don't see that majoritarian rule or majority uh, come has, has any way obstructed the development to a large extent. It also depends that whether the leadership of the minority, how it has envisioned the question of religion and how it has negotiated with the government of India, how it has positioned itself vis-a-vis -vis the states, certain exclusion also emerge from here. Not necessarily it is always following from the majoritarian rule. That's what my contention is. Yeah.